good evening i i will take the privilege on behalf of alkem to uh, uh, welcome to all our eminent eminent uh, chair speakers and panelists at the same time my hearty welcomes to all the attendees doctors who have taken the time out to attend this webinar and all of you are welcome in this critical quest and we we have a huge respect and we salute all the medical fraternities for the contribution in this crisis moment and uh, next one hour next one hour i believe it will be a knowledge dissemination program which we have started and it will be definitely uh, beneficial for you with that i will uh, introduce our uh, chief medical officer and president medical affairs global alchem dr akhilesh sharma who is there in the line with us dr akhilesh can you just uh, take hand over and then uh, proceed yeah uh, thanks uh, sandeep and uh, wish everybody a very pleasant day and uh, thank you for uh, joining the webinar today and uh, i am really we are all privileged to have with us an expert uh, panel who would address us today on the burning issue as we all know today especially the covid 19 and nobody other than better than the intensivists can really guide us in terms of the whole mha should uh, take care of them themselves during this situation and handling the, the entire pp uh, during the intensive care while managing the patients today because uh, there are so many uh, you know despite we know a lot of things about the covid 19 but there are still so many uncertainties about the virus and including uncertainties about the way uh, you all are dealing with the patients in in terms of uh you know which is a, a patient who may have a covid 19 positive status and who may not so with that uh, without staying between you and the expert panelist i have the privilege and honor of introducing uh, our uh, our chairperson today who would uh, be uh, navigating and moderating the session that is dr yatin mehta so dr yatin mehta actually uh, i'm sure you all know him and he doesn't really need an introduction but i i would just speak a little few words uh, about dr mehta uh, he is one of the uh, earliest uh, graduates from all india institute of medical sciences and then trained uh, further it it aims and then in nottingham uk denmark and sweden and he started the, his cardiac anesthesia at escorts heart institute and has been one of the pioneers in cardiac anesthesia and critical care he has been the past president of the indian association of cardiovascular thoracic anesthesiologists and a founder editor of the annals of uh, cardiac anesthesia he has been awarded with uh, frca uh, london and uh, of course fams with the national academy of uh, medical sciences and uh, the fiscm he is also the president and indian uh, of the indian society of critical care medicine the simultaneous uh, simulation society of india that is tss and uh, research society of anesthesia and clinical pharmacology that is rsacp he has edited textbooks uh, various textbooks including the critical care mcqs in critical care and the atlas for critical care he has to his credit more than 270 publications in various international peer reviewed journals and about 45 chapters which he has uh, written authored in the books he is an examiner for both critical care and cardiac anesthesia of national board of examination so welcome sir uh, we are very honored and privileged to have you and uh, over to you to finally take the proceedings of this webinar which alchem really wanted to initiate and bring the whole science uh, to the doctors thank you very much thank you very much for the kind introduction and it's a pleasure to be here and thank you sandeep and alchem for organizing this it is difficult times which we all of us are facing so without much ado i would like to introduce dr pradeep rangappa the from columbia asia hospital chief of intensive care unit there he is a, a, a vice president of indian society of critical care medicine is academically very active and a very good friend of mine so pradeep is going to give an overview of uh, uh, the status of uh, uh, covid 19 in india at the moment how to manage it also 
and then I will introduce you to uh, eminent panelists later on. Thank you. Pradeep, over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Atin. Thanks, Atin, for a very good introduction. Thanks so much. You're a good friend of us. So, in the, so what I'll do in next 20 minutes is uh, uh, for today's session, so I will go through the uh, the guidelines that have come from different countries so that it just gives a good teaser for all the panelists to deliberate because there are a lot of controversial topics in these guidelines uh, which has come from WHO, the Chinese and our Indian guidelines. So I will just give a bit, bit of an overview for all the panelists so that we can generate a good discussion on these guidelines because some of the what guidelines... What I will do in the next 20 minutes uh, is just give an overview of all the guidelines that have gone through the three guidelines, the WHO guidelines, which is very important. The reason being uh, because all of us adhere to uh, sort of a WHO as a broad principles. Then I've gone through the Chinese guidelines and I've gone through the Indian guidelines. So I've tried to uh, crystallize the essence out of these and put forth the broader view and see and generate a good discussion over the topics that we will be discussing. So I think this was this was, happened in India yesterday. So 5th April 2020, 9pm for 9 minutes. So, so these are the three guidelines I have gone through. So this WHO uh, interim guidance, this is the second guideline that came on 13th March 2020. The Chinese guidelines uh, came around uh, close to a month back and this All India Institute of Medical Sciences and uh, Government of India guidelines came around 27th March. Uh, so it will give a good sort of an overview and a lot of debatable issues that we could deliberate upon. So first we'll talk about uh, the case definition as defined by our ICMR. This is extremely important. So the, the patients who we should uh, become eligible for the testing is any symptomatic patient who has traveled overseas. So that uh, really qualifies as someone for whom the test has to be done. Symptomatic, what are the symptoms? Mainly the fever or sore throat, short of breath or cough. So any of these symptoms qualifies as uh, being eligible for getting the test done. So the second group are anyone uh, who is in contact with uh, positive patients. So any patient who is a positive and the close, any symptomatic close contact of this patient becomes eligible for getting the test done. Or it could be even asymptomatic high-risk individuals who are staying in the same household. So be it elderly people, vulnerable people with comorbid conditions who are staying along with these uh, patients who have, who have turned out to be COVID positive. They also become eligible for getting this test. And so this is ICMR guideline at this point of time. And the, generally the test that is recommended for high-risk individuals are at day 5 and day 14. So these are the two tests that are uh, sort of recommended for asymptomatic high-risk individuals who are in contact with for RT-PCR positive COVID patients or any of the symptomatic healthcare personnel. So any of the healthcare personnel who has uh, become symptomatic or otherwise who is uh, sort of suspicious of having contracted this becomes eligible. Or this is a new one that was added. Any of the patients who get admitted to the hospital with acute respiratory failure automatically qualify. So this obviously, we have had multiple debates in our states and uh, across India, because although we send the test, I think we can discuss this in panel. So, uh, so I know this is again a controversial that any patient with respiratory failure would qualify, but I think for the centers which do the test obviously have a lot of uh, hurdles when they embark on doing this test. Uh, so when you look at these guidelines, these guidelines really talk a lot. The WHO guideline in specific talks a lot and emphasizes a lot on triaging. So I've just put a layout of how I have triaged in our hospital because we were involved in how to create a triage area. So this is the layout of my ER which I have created. So this is a screening center. I'll show you the real pictures. I'll just show you a diagram. So this, was the, this is a space which is created outside the hospital, outside the emergency which are the screening area. So any patient who has a flu symptoms enters this area. And um, anyone who doesn't fulfill as a patient who would uh, need any screening would directly enter into a separate pathway and enter into the ER area where uh, generally all the care that needs to be given for non-suspects would be given. But any suspects who get screened here, he goes into a separate entrance where there are, uh, it is earmarked with red strips, which means he needs to be confined to that passage and then goes into the flu area where there is a personnel who is donned and doffed whenever a patient comes and the, the sampling would be done there and uh, whatever due admission process that needs to. So if it is a very stable patient, sampling will be done here and he'll be sent off home. But if a patient needs hospitalization, this is the pathway we have created that he enters this area where there is earmarked pathway, now passage where he enters and he enters a closed confined space 
where all due precautions are taken with all the protective equipment and then samples and further admissions happen so which means there is a segregation of patients between the covid suspects and the non covid in the er so this is how so whatever document you read indian document who or chinese there's always at least two two page write up on how triaging has to be done and as soon as patient is suspected of flu i think the first thing that we need to do is put a mask to the patient so because you minimize the spread of the infection imminently by putting a mask and uh, and uh, the droplets would be significantly uh, minimized and uh, once a covid suspicion is made once you have decided sampling has to be done then this uh, whole distancing starts because whatever procedure whatever has to be done i think uh, there should be a safe distance of at least minimum of 1 meter uh, distance to maintain uh, sort of a distancing and prevent uh, droplet infection so this is my hospital as you see this is the screening so whatever flow chart i showed you is what i'm showing the real picture so this is the place where they go any of the flu suspects they go in and they get evaluated there and if uh, they can go home sampling will be done here and goes home but if they need hospital admission then they enter into this emergency and i'll show you the next picture so this is the pathway they enter so there is a red strip so which means the trolley even doesn't cross there so they go there and then they deviate and uh, they enter this area so this is the flu sort of an area where patient goes and their sampling is done and further admission happens from there so this is the sort of triaging that we have done so this is the uh, area where uh, the covid suspects would go in get triaged from there as to whether they go to the covid area in the hospital or whether they go into intensive care uh, area and so on and so forth so what are the clinical features that has been described so 87.9% of them have fever and 13.9% of the patients have a uh, sort of sore throat and 18.6% of the patients have short of breath this is the general world statistics and 67.7% will have cough so these are general so pictorially they can have lot of non specific symptoms 13.6% have headaches 0.8% can have conjunctival suffusion 5% can have nasal sort of a congestion 0.9% uh, have been reported to have hemoptysis Uh, the significant symptom they can have is 38.38.1 percent of them can have fatigue. 14.8 percent of the patients can have uh, uh, severe muscle aches, and 3.7 percent will have diarrhea. And uh, ARDS, if you see the in all these guidelines, uh, these statistics, whatever I'm articulating is taken from the guidelines. So ARDS is around 3 percent is what is quoted as people who develop ARDS. but what is interesting is significant proportion see 86% of the patients will have ct abnormalities so if you have a symptomatic patients x ray will pick it up only 59% of the times but if you have someone with little short of breath and tachypnea it is desirable to do ct because ct picks up the infiltrates much early and this has been the pretty much the experience across the world that ct has a better ability to pick up these uh, infiltrates so they have classified so i have taken the classification from chinese and the who so pretty much they are similar but chinese have classified severe into critical as well i'll just take you through so the mild is where imaging is absolutely normal and symptoms are very mild they can go self quarantine and they can be looked after at home moderate is where they have uh, ongoing fever and bad cough and uh, ongoing sore throat and there may be some subtle features of pneumonia on imaging severe cases is what i think all our esteemed panelists would be dealing with uh, where you have patient with tachypnea where you have a drop in saturation less than 93 so icmr says uh, not icmr the aims uh, who says 94 chinese say 93 who also says 93 so you can pick up this number so these are all numbers and pao2 fio2 less than 300 qualify as severe cases and severe cases also mean they, where there is more than 50% progression in the lung infiltrates either in ct or in chest x ray within 24 to 48 hours there has been progression of these lung infiltrates uh, which has happened more than 50% so the chinese guidelines if you look i think the who stops with severe the chinese guidelines looks in as a critical cases also critical cases is where they have come to icu they have got mechanically ventilated and they may be in shock plus or minus shock but they have other organ dysfunction so and they once they are ventilated the chinese have uh, classified into based on the complaints so where the respiratory system complaints is more than 30 or it is more than or equal to 15 with mild to moderate organ dysfunction or the severest one the stage 3 or whatever is respiratory uh, system complaints is less than 50 with multi organ failure so these are the 
three uh, you know sort of a classifications chinese have done once they are intubated and based on compliance basically but i know i think panelists would be discussing on the compliance issue because there's so much noise based on this compliance happening nowadays and what are the indications for hospital admission all guidelines say i think this is very quite archaic or intuitive i don't think any of us panelists need this sort of a guideline anyone who appears very safe whose blood pressure is a bit low but i think tachypnea is a very sensitive sign to pick up to consider uh, to at least reasonably consider some observation and saturation less than 93 we don't need a rocket science to say they need admission but anyone with a tachypnea you would have a little low threshold to get them admitted and there are certain high risk for severe disease that uh, that has been globally accepted in all these guidelines elderly people are vulnerable and they qualify as having severe disease so possibly your uh, thresholds to admit them would be much lower or any any patients with comorbidities hypertension diabetes or any end organ disease like lung disease copd or liver disease or kidney disease any of these on the background qualify as patients having high risk for uh, progressive worsening so we'll just look into the world data so this particular study came on 28th feb by chinese authors so they looked at the statistics if you are interested so icu admission 5% 2% get mechanically ventilated and the rate was 1.4% so the composite endpoint was around 6.1% so this was a study which again came from chinese group on 15th feb in lancet so where they showed the 29% developed drds 12% developed cardiac dysfunction 12% develop secondary and icu 10% needed icu admission so these statistics statistics are quite variable across the globe as you see earlier stages the icu admission was less but as and when disease progressed icu admission started increasing and even the death rate see if you see the first article which came in uh, february that showed uh, sort of less death rate but then once they come to icu the death rate went to double digit around 15% so they tried to see what are the predictors for death age was definitely an important predictor so this came in the lancet article on 9th march so the age had an odds of 1.1 that was significant and any patient who has a higher sofa had a high odds of dying and this was a very important one they identified d dimer as a very important predictor and an independent uh, predictor of death so d dimer had an odds of 18.42 which was very high as a uh, as indicative of uh, death in patients with covid so these these three were identified as independent risk factors in this lancet article by chinese authors and they looked at comorbidities 48% of the severe comorbids uh, uh, 48% of the patients who needed hospital admission had comorbidities hypertension appeared the commonest and this came again from the lancet article 19% had diabetes and 8% had coronary artery disease and what is uh, uh, again this particular uh sort of a lancet article uh, is a very good one which looked at the viral shedding and the median duration of viral shedding once patient gets uh, affected was 20 days so which means to say when they get uh, uh, infected with covid they continue to shed the virus up to 20 days and the interquartile range was 17 to 24 days and the longest duration until which the patients continue to shed virus was 37 days so at this point of time i have a patient uh, with covid who has been shedding virus for more than 12 days all samples coming positive despite being on hcq hydroxychloroquine because we know that guaret study from france which came which said hydroxychloroquine you give uh, in the dose uh, that viral shedding stops by day 6 but somehow in in the patient we have right now in the ward uh, shedding continues to happen despite being on hcq that's, that's for panelists to discuss later and 95% of the patients received antibiotics uh, from this lancet article 21% of these patients received lopinavir and ritonavir as a treatment and 32 patients needed mechanical ventilation so this was a study done in 198 patients three patients needed ecmo so but what is disturbing to note from this lancet article was that 97% of the mechanically ventilated patients died so this is something which is really alarming for all our intensivists that once they go to mechanical ventilator the mortality seems to be very high although uh, the data that is coming from italy and us doesn't show such a high mortality but still for us the mortality is at least anywhere beyond 50 to 60% uh, once they go on ventilator so i think this is an important point that i'm sure will be deliberated extensively during the course of our panel and some of the complications that covid patients have had was sepsis septic shock ards and heart failure and uh, the d dimer and high sensitivity cardiac troponin also was always found to be high in non survivors which means to say there's a certain degree of myocardial dysfunction that happens 
and that also portends a poor uh, prognostic sign in these COVID patients. And 31% of them had VAP. So this was a study from Lancet. It's a very good study you know, done in 198 patients by Zoe et al., which came in Lancet. So now we'll move into the management of mild cases. I think here there are a lot of controversies, which I think will give a good recipe for panelists to discuss. So I have tried to uh, look through all the guidelines and see uh, what are the common ones that I've taken. So symptomatic treatment is no brainer. You give paracetamol. Cough syrups are recommended by our Indian guidelines, but uh, the Chinese and uh, uh, the WHO guidelines do not really advocate cough syrups. So hydroxychloroquine, I think, uh, is very strongly recommended in our Indian guidelines, and so do the Chinese guidelines. WHO sorts of uh, sort of says that yes, chloroquine. There have been multiple studies. Uh, larger data is done. It should be considered. They just leave it on the fence. So the hydroxychloroquine, 400 mg twice a day or day one, followed by 200 mg twice a day for four days is what is recommended in the guidelines. Our Indian guidelines suggest that we should give vitamin C, 500 mg twice a day for five days. So we can discuss on all these. And azithromycin is recommended in uh, most of these guidelines, uh, 500 mg. For these are all for mild. And Indian guidelines suggest Tamiflu until the test comes uh, positive for COVID, uh, with, uh, until, until the test is awaited. So after mild case, obviously you'll initiate treatment and send them home. It is recommended they should not use any public transport to go home. They should go in a uh, vehicle which needs to be sanitized later in an appropriate way. And they should go and self-quarantine because the mild cases don't need hospital admission. And they need to be at home quarantined uh, and, and, the, and the fever has to be monitored for at least 72 hours. But if fever doesn't come down in 72 hours, they need to review back to the hospital and see. And symptom onset to seven days or until two samples uh, are negative 24 hours apart, they need to be quarantined. But I think we all have sort of concluded that 14 days they go for a self-quarantine. I think the 14 days is sort of mentioned because um, seven days they can still remain asymptomatic and they can still continue to shred the, the virus after treatment as well. So 14 days is what we generally consider as a norm. But the seven days uh, is what I think WHO has said seven days. So we can argue on that. But I think in India, we have, we have sort of agreed that 14 days is a home quarantine that they need. So hospitalized cases. So obviously once they are sicker and they need hospital admission, uh, so they need to be put on oxygen. So all recommendations say they need to be put on five liters to maintain saturation more than 94%. But if you are dealing with a patient who has severe acute respiratory infection, what we call it a SARI, then we need to put them straight away on a non-rebreather mask for 10 to 15 liters per minute so that the, you don't experiment trying to put them on a face mask and then move on. So basically we have to avoid hypoxia. What they need is possibly oxygen at the initial phase. So you want to maintain saturation more than 93 to 94, and then you can wean the oxygen off as and how situation evolves. And uh, all three guidelines suggest you restrictive fluid resuscitation. So we should not, we should uh, not prefer to overload them. I'm sure the panelists would argue on this because there is a lot of data coming on whether they should be U-volumic, hypovolemic, or maybe little on a volume liberal because now the new data is emerging that uh, they have more of vascular issues. So we'll talk on this during panel discussion. But restrictive is what all three guidelines have sort of recommended. I'm sure my friend Rajesh Mishra will be now laughing when I showed this NIV uh, because all three guidelines talk on, uh, N you could consider NIV as deemed appropriate for a short term to see if they respond. I'm sure all panelists would disagree with this, but I'm just telling what is mentioned in the guidelines with a good mask interface and they have mentioned helmet mask is desirable, but all of us have to be aware that this NIV trial has to be given in negative pressure with all PPE gear because the risk of aerosolization. So we, I won't dwell into this. So if you have HFNC or this uh, NIV, uh, so the, all three guidelines does say you could give a small trial. Obviously you would not persevere in continuing with it if they are struggling. So I leave it at that. I'm sure Rajesh Mishra, all of them, my good friends will have it. Uh, uh, you know, their uh, opinion on this. And all three guidelines suggest blood cultures have to be sent and appropriate antibiotics has to be initiated within one hour. So even here, time is an essence. So the, all the guidelines recommend that as, as soon as possible, antibiotics of uh, whatever you think is appropriate, including community cover antibiotics, has to be administered. Azithromycin is recommended in all three guidelines and Tamiflu, uh, Indian guidelines uh, strongly recommend that Tamiflu has to be added. So investigations, this, there's no brainer in this. So routine investigation, which includes CBC, kidney function test, liver functions, ABG is a mandatory. 
So chest X-ray, HRCT. Obviously, I think uh, although guidelines say you have to get imaging, whatever is appropriate. Uh, so if patient is tachypneic and who is needing oxygen, uh, our recommendation would be definitely to go for HRCT because you have 86 or more than 85 percent ability to pick up the infiltrates. If you only limit to X-ray, uh, you fall that uh, you get down the percentage to 59 percent. And ECG is also needed. So just to show my good friend, uh, all the panelists, that these are the actual recommendations I have taken, the cut paste. So this is the no, WHO no. where they suggest high flow and non-invasive. No, this is no, the no, Indian no. guidelines which suggest NIV may be considered. This is the Chinese guidelines which says NIV. So I'll leave that for debaters to debate. But I think if you see all the Italian videos or uh, UK videos, I think all the patients uh, are put on this sort of a helmet mask. I think these are the ones which we should be using, but uh, we have difficulty in getting this helmet mask in our country. But if you are contemplating on using NIV, uh, definitely this is the way to go is what I would think. Uh, so close monitoring of vitals, uh, obviously once they get admitted to hospital, it is very important. It is emphasized time and again that every patient who gets admitted with COVID, with some respiratory symptoms, oxygen saturation has to be monitored with a simple pulse oximeter of some sort. Because time and again, all panelists would agree later on that their oxygen suddenly dips and they can have sudden episodes of desaturation and their down spirals can be quite rapid. So I think the simplest tool that we can recommend is they need to be continuously monitored on uh, pulse oximeter for oxygen saturation. Chinese guidelines time and again, they reiterate that uh, every admitted patient it's very terribly important to monitor the oxygen saturation because they time and again mentioned that rapid deterioration is the norm and multiple uh, uh, information you uh, all of us have read that rapid deterioration is the norm in COVID. So obviously NIV when you put, it's, you just monitor, observe and see if they're winning. If they don't, I think you have to go ahead and intubate. Uh, so obviously when you put them on NIV, you see whether, or HFNC, whether their mental status is improving, whether their comfort is improving or short of breath and obviously we'll monitor ABG. So intubation, so any patient where PaO2 F5 is less than 200 and there is some hemodynamic instability, we have to go ahead and intubate. All guidelines uniformly say early intubation. So the norm is don't wait on NIV for very long, even if you're put in. Uh, so many of us obviously would agree that NIV may not be the best thing in Indian setting. So, but we'll talk about it. So when you are intubating, I think the key essence is there is an intubation guidelines that has come from Australian group in COVID patients. In COVID, how do we intubate? There is a good article that has come. It is a preprint. I've just uh, gone through it. So extreme vigilance. We should have absolute plan because there's no failure. It is You have to treat COVID intubation as a difficult to intubate, which means to say be prepared for every eventuality because no one can rush in to help a person who is intubating because there is a huge time lag for someone to don and come inside to help you. So it has to be treated as difficult intubation. You have to be absolutely prepared with all the gear, have a ProSeal, LMA, and it is suggested you should avoid bag mask, but you pre-oxygenate for five minutes. Uh, it says five minutes, some say three to five minutes, have a giddle so that you are oxygenation. So this is the, uh, they say two hand wise grip is what, so this picture I have taken from the Australian guidelines. Uh, so you keep the mask absolutely firm and uh, prevent absolute air leakage to, to prevent. So this is the article. So I urge uh, all the listeners to go through this uh, airway article that's come from Australia. So I, I don't know if we, in here we can have so much luxury. So this is called COVID airway. So the suggested people is four people to be there when you're intubating because in Australia is always an emphasis. Uh, it's a four person technique, but uh, so there are two airway doctors. But I think what I have done in my hospital is that there will be one person who will be intubating, there will be one outside on a standby uh, who would be sort of a, who would be ready to don if he needs assistance. And if you see the Australian guidelines, they say outside there should be two runners to help if uh, they need in the ante room. Uh, so I'm a little unsure whether we can have so much comfort in our country, but this is the guideline that has come from Australian group. And they have look, they have described this checklist. You can take this checklist and adopt it uh, to our suitability. So as, as you see, all the difficult airway set is there, Macintosh, all those stuff is there. And this is the circuit that has come from that article. Basically, you need to have a viral filter between the ET tube and the entitled CO2 and then to ventilate it. Uh, so, like you have all the gear, you have all the stilettes, bougie, difficult airway, and uh, although this cartoon doesn't show it, so you need to be completely geared up with full PPE before you intubate. So, 
basically the message is uh, any intubation you have no room for error so once you go in with the covid tray and the covid checklist uh, you can't ask for more help because you have to be absolutely prepared to intubate because you won't get any help uh, without uh, you know having all the standby at your disposal so that is the crux of the thing so you have to treat it like difficult intubation have all the gear before you go in and intubate and because you don't want any more dramas there or because otherwise you'll be putting other people at risk no one will come to help if you are in a in a trouble without adequate preparation i think that's the message on intubation so once you have intubated close suction is always the way to go i think this is uniformly recommended in all guidelines and all guidelines suggest that all the filters and the 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 tubings ventilated tubings have to be changed 48 hourly so that's little hard uh, in our circumstances because of uh, financial socio financial issues so uh, i think we can discuss on this uh, whether we, we will be able to change this the circuit every 48 but definitely hme we could change so ventilation i won't go into depth so these are general principles again all the panelists can argue on these ventilatory strategies so they suggest uh, low tidal volume flat flat of pressures less than 30 it's a typical ards uh, narrative that is given in all the guidelines pao2 by fio2 less than 200 even who guidelines says high peep could be considered but we know peep is not helping our patients and pao2 fio2 uh, 200 to 300 we know high peep is not beneficial recruitment maneuvers they say but protein use is not investigated all this we can debate in our panel discussion because uh the current uh, understanding is it's not behaving like our typical ards but there are two variants one with low compliance one with uh, normal compliance we'll discuss that proning is uh, advocated by italian group because they have found the lungs are recruitable if, if we can uh, wind up in a few minutes some pathetic covers uh, if the patient is not improving and fi2 is less than 150 uh if your fi2 is going more than 60 so early proning is the way to go if you are hitting the roof with low compliance patient and uh, and if you are following all the arts net so i just want to draw about this particular paper which came from gattinoni in uh, ajrcc which is a good uh, sort of observation made by gattinoni so this came in 30th march 2020 this is just to uh, give room for the good discussion that should happen in 16 patients they looked at how the covid 19 ards behaved so they found see if you look at the compliance uh, this paper says all the 16 patients they had a very good compliance so this is what is something which does not conform to our typical ards and they saw the, the shunt fraction was very disproportionate to the good compliance they found and the hypothesis gattinoni makes is the, the lung perfusion so it's basically this is the high point of our discussion the whole perfusion is somewhere that is sort of a ventilation perfusion mismatch that is happening and lung perfusion regulation is something that is lost is what is hypothesized and because of hypoxia there is severe vasoconstriction and even the autopsy reports are showing there is micro thrombi that develops in all this pulmonary uh, uh, you know pulmonary circulation so again this is again uh, unfolding a new sort of our understanding of uh, why these patients are becoming hypoxic and why they are uh, we are treating them as ards so this all leads to a lot of speculation uh, because unless we start treating our ventilated patients and see what their compliance is doing i think everything becomes hypothesis but if you have to subscribe to this it suggests that yes their compliance is good it's not the compliance problem mm -hmm. it's a perfusion problem i think that is where the whole hypothesis of heparin infusion is coming in and i will discuss that in panel so that's the graphical representation where compliance is very good shunt fraction is very low and the conclusions gattinoni makes is uh, the increased intrathoracic negative pressure in spontaneously breathing patients uh, if you put them on hfnc leads to self inflicted lung injury or cle what you say and uh, so i think this is a very important thing he says when you give high peep uh, considering they are ards so you have this non recruitable lungs in covid patients uh, where the high peep rather than being any beneficial is leading to hemodynamic impairment and fluid retention which may be detrimental for this covid 19 lung so this is a very important message of uh, gattinoni gives in this paper and if you prone you well compliance is very good but you are proning this patient again Adib, you'll have to wind up uh, soon yeah, yeah. so i'm just finishing so this uh, so this is the last slide i think so the covid 19 specific tests so you can do ddimer ferritin ldh high sensitivity cardiac troponin and uh, you can give uh, inhalers through um, uh, mdis and steroids is not recommended specific therapy hcq and uh, you can give uh, lopinavir ritonavir is recommended by icmr and you have to do this so i think that's the last slide i think so i'll just take you through the whatsapp images and then i'll end my talk thank you i think uh so we can 
generate discussion from here. Over to you, I think. Thank you, Pradeep. Excellent, excellent overview of how to diagnose and how to triage and how to manage these patients once they're intubated or not. And what therapies are uh, under consideration? I think, uh, see, we, I was told to primarily concentrate on non-medical aspects, administrative aspects of uh, uh, COVID-19, that is ICU preparedness and PPE and how to protect your workers. And we had a, Saturday we had a marathon webinar through ICCM conducted very, very efficiently by Rajesh Mishra. It was three and a half hours uh, uh, marathon uh, webinar, which covered all these aspects in pretty detail. So I will just, I think five minutes I'll allow uh, audience to ask a few questions on these aspects and then I will switch to what I've been uh, told to take care of. So uh, what are the questions? One of the questions was, what about the role of prophylactic hydroxychloroquine? Anybody from the panelists? See, prophylactic hydroxychloroquine, currently the ICMR recommends that it should be given only to those persons who are or healthcare professionals only. Healthcare professionals who are being managing or exposed to COVID positive patients or the relatives who are taking care of a COVID positive patients. Correct. So that's the only two indications what they have been given. That, that is one. No normal person uh, or a normal citizen who is not exposed should take hydroxychloroquine. In short. Any comment from anybody else on the therapy? On, on yeah. therapy? In therapy in general? On yeah, hydroxychloroquine. On hydroxychloroquine. On hydroxychloroquine, sir. Nay, in general, I think Pradeep has covered it pretty well. What we really need to understand that every stage you need to protect your health care worker or staff. We will come to that. That is the second part of yes. the whole uh, As far as treatment is concerned, we are focusing on three things right now. That is hydroxychloroquine as a treatment, azithromycin as a part of combination monitoring QTC. We, are, we do add uh, all the patient flu wheel because we know H1N1 can be a co associated infection. And uh, to cover community acquired pneumonia, we do add antibiotics. Right now, if we say that we go with that, apart from other treatment, particularly IL-6 inhibitor, depending upon its interleukin uh, level we are monitoring, um, and um, based on that, we can decide about. So general treatment is that, and then care of the patient. Yeah, see, there, uh, the antiviral therapies are not that uh, much strongly recommended nowadays. Retinovir, lopinovir. Um, uh, has not really come out. Even the Chinese randomized trial was not really positive. And remdes were there, some some hope there, but again, it is too early to say. And there are other therapies now available because what they say now it is a cytokine storm, which in the second week uh, tilts the balance the wrong way with the endocrine perfusion uh, happening and all that. So tocilizumab also studies are on. I am also conducting one randomized uh, large trial on that. Cytokine adsorbers have been used, zilastatin have been used, but these are all, all on compassionate ground. So it's not really um, uh, what has been, uh, what is the standard of therapy. I was just having a webinar before this, and there was a major discussion with some Detroit guys who are uh, Kulkarni, with a large, uh, they have 10,000 patients. They have 300 and plus patients already in house. And they have started, what they've realized now is, uh, something to think about, that as they say, it's an inflammatory response which um, uh, uh, directs which way the disease and pathology is heading, they are going for early steroid therapy. And uh, prednisolone, one milligram per kilo in divided doses, starting early for three to seven days, they say. And he said after they've started using that, their patients, the, the code blues have significantly reduced the patients uh, deteriorating on oxygen therapy has reduced. Their ventilated patients also number has significantly gone now. And he's saying this paper is going to be published very soon. Sir, sir, two, two things. Meta said two things. Uh, one is the steroid, that is the same dose what you are mentioning, one milligram per kg in 24 hours. Preferably methyl penicillin. We should give in two or three dividers because it is uh, inflammation and particularly early fibrosis which is killing this patient. And second thing, uh, I think there is a scope because it's a micro thrombi which are very obvious and they are causing the all perfusion related problem. So, I mean, we have to go beyond the dose of prophylaxis and go higher dose for anticoagulant till we understand about the, this. Because the, here the clot formation is activation of interleukin C and particularly those macrophages 
those activation are leading to formation of clots so those clot formation that is true are... also but one oh. must keep it in mind dvt prophylaxis is a must yeah. these patients most of them are pro pop microthrombi yeah. and end organ failure is primarily because of that Why obviously circulation dic can happen in some terminal cases but uh, this uh, needs to be taken into consideration uh, uh, let me now i think go to the second part of a uh, um as a uh, meeting and I, i would like to introduce uh, my co-panelists uh, the senior lead panelists are subhash dikshit he is a chief intensivist at uh, santivani hospital and uh, past president of iscm everybody knows him the other panelists is uh, rajesh mishra he is a, again everybody knows him as a consultant intensivist at uh, in ahmedabad and uh, past general secretary and Uh, he has a very bright future in the ICC. I'm sure. Yes. And then we have a uh, uh, Yash Javeri. Yash also everyone knows is very active in ICC. I mean, at the moment he's now in uh, Lucknow. Uh, Dr. Subha Reddy is head critical care. Again, Subha everybody knows he's a uh, Apollo um, uh, Hyderabad. Subha can never be seen. Subha can never be seen. He's not Subha there. Subha I can't see. He's not there. Yeah. Okay. And then Bhaskar Chaudhary is a senior microbiologist in infection control. in charge of pns uh, hospital um, uh, kolkata so welcome all of you thank you sir okay so from the clinical side i think we now switch to the administrative side or from prevention and hospital infectious point of view so now coming to the icu preparedness did any of you how do you think you get your team ready for for this thing happening we all are getting ready now because the thing is going to explode maybe any day now so how do you plan and how do you prepare yes i'll shall i start yeah yes yeah. yeah i think the first step is risk mitigation we have to keep our heart together we have no, to have everybody puts their this thing on mute then the sound is better yeah we have to mobilize our resources we have to mobilize our icu resources we have to mobilize our human resources we have to have an intercity network of icus we have to have a plan to convert each area into a potential icu we start with small resort but and gradually increase our capacity we should be ready to have a place which will take over our spills it might be another hospital it might be another center in another hospital our supply chain should be preserved that is again very very essential doctor yes sir sorry to interrupt Your yeah. voice is a little low, sir. If you could come a little closer to the. Okay, sure, sure, sure. Thank Please. you. Pleasure, pleasure. Risk mitigation is first. Second is we have to have our manpower trained. We should have other specialties, non-acute care specialties should be roped in, especially for treating patients who are in ward for counselling. Our electronic interface for interaction should be ready. our supply chain should be ready we should be having a plan small number of patients we take a reserve part of our hospital as the number grows we should be able to take make the whole hospital into an icu and we should have a network of icus in our each city yeah rajesh how do you build an interpersonal team sir in this sort of situation thank you thank you sir thanks for this question in fact uh, at present uh, uh, we have to go on certain calculation and presumption so suppose i start with a 10 bed icu uh, where i will be taking 10 patient the first and foremost important thing we have to remember that each area right from the ambulance to emergency to entry of the patient till icu should be separate in any hospital wherever we are managing this patient it should not be mixed with the common patient preferably i am of the opinion that it should be a dedicated covid hospital to avoid if it is not if you are every hospital is taking segregate everything that is the first most now coming to the our uh, icu preparedness we need certain level uh, <clears throat> we know that we will not be able to provide one is to one care to the patient is not possible also and simultaneously we need to have a backup because once they start start duty they will have a risk of infection they will have risk to infect their other relative so the plan starts like that i will start with 10 or 12 bed icu i will go 1 is to 4 or 1 is to 6 maximum 1 is to 4 care 
uh, proper nursing staff, that means I have a 12 bed, so I need minimum of three uh, nursing staff in one shift. They cannot do more than six hour shift because with all those apron on, with all those things on, it's humanly, uh, humanly un impossible that somebody can wear it for more than six hours. So all those staff who are going to do hard work, that means you need at least, even if you're three, you need at least 12 staff per day. That means at least you need put, uh, put 36 staff to cover all those things if you want to do it properly. That will be the first, it is nursing staff. Now these are the main staff. You need supporting staff also because uh, one staff taking care of four patients is not possible. At least you need one or two staff to support them. So first thing will be the staff preparation, the numbering, uh, staff number. Once we have got that number ready, uh, maybe I, I can start with lesser number, their training. Their training, how to uh, uh, wear those protective gloves, how to remove those gloves, what they should prepare before entering in those gowns and what they should after entering gowns. So that will be the second part will be the training of taking care of themselves. Once they have taken care of themselves, the third stage will be what they should do with patient, what they should not do patient. Particularly the most important thing, they should not do any procedure which <coughs> spills over, which just uh, the uh, secretion should get spread. So they should avoid all kinds of procedure. That means patient will be totally locked, closed suction, and uh, not allowing, not too much of, no cupping allowed. All these things they have to be trained with. So number of it up, coming, coming to the doctors. Doctors, at least for 10 beds, you will need a one uh, uh, registrar level of doctor at least to inform you, uh, to give you a backup. Suppose you are going for more ICU bed, maybe you are the, uh, uh, in charge of the total taking care of ICU, maybe you are having, but at a one time. Now these doctors also cannot wear those gloves and he can also not be there in uh, those suits for more than eight hours. So at least you will need three doctors in a rotation to give you the backup. That means even if you go for the seven days on and uh, seven days off maybe, at least you need six doctors backup. Why every time we are saying, if one has to remember that you cannot have a daily kind of rota because the moment you go home, very likely you are going to infect your relative family. Okay. Hello, Subhan, can you hear me? Yeah, so yes. these are the issue which we have to take care of. Oh, one request to every panelist, just stick to about two minutes for each answer so that yeah, you can include yeah, everybody. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Subal, now one quick question to you. Yes, sir. Is what sort of stocks you need to, to have in your uh, position? So the stock taking basically is the PPEs, the N95 mask, the normal mask, the gowns, the goggles, and uh, the shoes. That's the main important thing because the number of PPEs which are really going to be required in the ICU for managing ventilated patients is going to be quite large enough. That day I was just discussing and taking into consideration for a 10 bedded ICU, it may also require approximately about 20 to 30 PPEs uh, per day. Uh, so you require a large amount of stock of PPE which should be kept and procured. That's uh, very important. So the stock is important and apart from that I also need to have a G machine all the, the technicians also should be trained or even the doctors also should be trained for taking out x-rays in case uh, if required and along with the crash card special laryngoscope if required a, a fiber optic uh, disposable uh, laryngoscope also should be considered and all those uh, uh, stock taking should be taken into consideration and should be maintained. Be yeah, so as, as little movement of the equipment outside the ICU as possible. Yes, sir. So I have stationed in a, a portable x ray machine where you can look at the films also. I have an ultrasound machine inside. I have yes. POCT for uh, PCT. Um, and uh, whatever is required, you can post it inside and uh, <laughs> don't come sir, out. Uh, sir, very simple that it should be dedicated to that area. I don't take out anything, whatever is needed there. You, anything, yeah. yeah. It's not and possible. Always over calculate your requirement. Yeah. You know, the administration okay. will always try to, to cut it. And there is no question, nobody can work more than six hours, you know, in, in that environment, as Pradesh uh, rightly said. And, sir, one more thing. That exactly. at least when you start working, keep at least seven days stock every time ready because your stock very fast get over and then finally you can land up in a situation where you are not having those protective gloves and then you cannot work. 
So that's the reason should not be right. The backup plan should be ready also. Very the important. first principle is without a proper PPE, do not enter the COVID ICU. That's yeah, the that first and most important. You must remember. Okay, Dr. Chaudhary, I got a question, quick question to you. That how do you dispose the biomedical? Yes. Yes. Actually, the National Biomedical Waste Guidelines, they have uh, the National Pollution Control Board has come up with the uh, guidelines. So this is nothing different from the guidelines that are prevalent, 2016 and 2018 guidelines. Only thing that is that uh, we have everything yellow. Everything goes into yellow now and double jacketed yellow. Okay. So all the things, even gloves should be disposed in yellow in the uh, COVID ICU. Okay, or COVID word, which is designated for COVID. That is the only difference that is there. And we have to mark uh, on the when it goes finally for disposal, we have to uh, properly secure it. And then everything, we have to mark that it's COVID-19 positive. So that's the only difference. Otherwise, the disposal is the same. And in certain cases, we are also being forced to use the surgical gowns in, uh, say, in the suspect areas in the world, not in ICCU. So surgical gowns, we, are, uh, we have given a drum containing 1% sodium hypochlorite in that. So the uh, linen also goes into that, in that drum. It's uh, dipped there overnight, and then uh, it goes for washing. So overnight uh, treatment with 1% sodium hypochlorite or bleaching solution is enough to kill the virus. Yes. Can I add, sir? Sure. Can I add, sir? Hmm. Yeah. We have to we have to be very very particular. Whatever whatever goes in the hot area stays there. Whatever comes out has to be sanitized. And we should be using maximum disposable things. Even bed sheets yes. and patient clothes could be disposable, and avoid recycling those things. Yes. Doctor Yatin, your mic is muted, sir. Meta sir, your sound is not there. Huh. Yeah. Once your say uh, gowns, uh, conventional surgical gowns, not the disposable ones. Suppose they have gone to the laundry. Yes. Uh, do you give PPE to the laundry personnel? Laundry persons actually. That's why we are uh, pre-treating them in sodium hypochlorite and sending to the laundry. But basic PPE should be owned by all. So uh, the basic PPE is goggles, mask, at least surgical mask, and gloves. These are the basic PPE. If a gown is available, then wear a gown or apron or plastic apron. Okay, that brings me to the question of who should get N95 masks because that is, there is a gross shortage. Not only here, in US they are reusing the N95 masks. So who should be using N95 masks? Actually, there are clear cut guidelines regarding this also. So uh, any aerosol generating procedure, anybody who is con conducting any aerosol generating procedure should always wear an N95 mask. And anyone who is in the COVID positive world, uh, taking care of COVID positive patients for the shifts, say six hour or eight hour shifts, they should wear the N95 masks. So aerosol generating procedure even includes the sample collection and nebulization and uh, and another thing is regarding the dental procedures. They are also aerosol generating. So uh, I have advised uh, now the dental procedures are being held up because the OPDs are closed in most of the places. But whenever uh, dental procedures are also, uh, and the ENT surgeons are also at risk. Okay. So these are certain cases. There are other aerosol generating procedures also. So we have to identify those procedures. Meta sir, your voice is not audible. Meta sir, your voice is off. You don't switch off your mic, sir. What? What about endoscopy? Yeah, sir. Endoscopy yeah. is again equally dangerous as dangerous as an endotracheal intubation. Yeah. So all do precaution because we have some case reports from India where upper GI endoscopy was done and the patient got infected. So it has to be done with due vigilance and equal full PP precaution. One word on N95. Whenever we are in close contact with suspect or confirmed case, yeah. or whenever we are in a closed space like an ambulance or in a closed room like an ICU, we should be wearing N95. For routine interaction, surgical mask is good enough. So even the intercollegiate, even the intercollegiate association for surgeons have come out with guidelines for 
surgical patients. That means all emergency surgery should be treated like a COVID and even endoscopy suites should be taken as a COVID patient and all the endoscopies have to be compulsorily in PPE. And now they are recommending as per them that any emergency surgeries or surgeries How does one get so, so, so many PPEs? I mean, yeah, I know, I know it's very difficult. Uh, intubation, yeah. intubation is Sir, important. So the, for, time being, for time being to manage the resources, it should be highly recommended that all the planned procedure, maybe it is upper GI, it should be different. Should be different. Be called because yeah. right now, the if it is not emergency, if it is a planned procedure, they should be deferred for timing. Yeah. So there is a question. Be, it can be scopy. It can be anything. If it is not emergency, it should not be done. All the planned procedures. There is a question from the audience that can you reuse N95 masks? Yes, uh, I can answer that. Actually, yeah, I asked CDC uh, for a quick solution on this because we have to improvise nowadays. So CDC has come up with certain uh, one we were already using, the UVGI, the ultraviolet radiation. Although uh, it causes some damage to the structural integrity of the masks, and most of these masks are reuse uh, not reusable, they are disposable. So I have advised, we have formed a UV room that is the easiest and other, there are some other re recommendations like hot air oven and these uh, things, but uh, they may cause damage to the rubber, rubber band. So UV GI is the best option that is available. And if it is put under UV radiation for half an hour, each side, uh, total for one hour, then it becomes uh, reusable. But actually for the Positive patients, those who are taking off the care of the positive patients, I've asked them to dispose them, uh, dispose the 95 masks. But this reusable also, you cannot reuse for more than 72 hours if you are using constantly. See, they say the N95 masks should not be used constantly more than six hours. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Actually, also, some studies have shown in US of it reuse so safely. Stanford is a Stanford study for 20 types. Hmm. For 2010. Recently, plasma sterilization has been approved also. You can do plasma sterilization. What we have started doing at our place is that we have a hot air oven, which has also been used. They published studies on yeah. that. 75 degrees for half an hour. Hmm. So we provide them up with a bag with the person's name, and we are saying we use it for six times. So they keep a log on it. After six times, they throw it and they take another one. Because we'll have to start... Uh, Restricting the proper uses of this, otherwise we are going to land up with serious trouble. Sir, one more thing to save the resources that there are now there are grade one and grade two PP. So all those people who are not in direct contact with the patient and uh, uh, aerosol generating procedure, they can be given grade one PP, and uh, that will again save the resources. That concept also has to be utilized. One has to think for that also. No, I absolutely agree with you. The patient, people who are directly working in aerosol generating uh, procedures in these patients, obviously should be fully geared. But others can yeah. be in way grade one, which is uh, lesser than this, which is probably more comfortable also. Yeah. And uh, which should uh, limit the uh, resources. And they can increase their time to eight hours and more for duty if they want, they can do that. So that will save human resources as well as the uh, uh, material resources. Yeah, but the PPE one must remember, there every corner tailor is making PP now, you know. Yeah. So what is the PP which is required in this thing? It has to be waterproof, and there are other criteria also. But it has to be waterproof in a two atmosphere. It should, the water should not go in. Yeah, that is what the testing thing. Obviously, we can't test it as that, but waterproofing uh, we must insist on before we uh, start using this PP. So also, the glasses. One has to keep it in mind. The, okay. the glasses which you wear on top of your this thing should be having a seal. Today I was shown a pair of glasses which had some holes for ventilation. So there's no ventilation, otherwise it fogs. I said it doesn't serve the purpose. You know, it has to be proper seal. Yeah. Pradeep, Pradeep, can you comment on this? What you are saying, Pradeep? Uh, can you comment? Pradeep is showing something. Meta sir, Pradeep is showing. Uh, Pradeep is coming. Uh, yeah, you're not, you are not audible, Pradeep. You are not audible. I'm not audible. Yeah, not audible. You're breaking. <laughs> yeah, but I can see that. Yeah, yeah. So, this is what uh, we have been using it for our team. The reason is that the specific. Doctor, your voice is. Uh, there are a lot of disturbance in your voice. Okay, okay. Now, but what he was showing, I can see that. 
Yeah, this yeah. is the FFP2 and FFP3 masks, yes, yes. which which are quite effective. In fact, in NHS, they are issuing these masks for they can use it for two months. Yeah, and yeah, they yeah, clean yeah. the filter and they can use it for two months. Yeah, yeah. So if you can lay your hands on these, do that because they are probably more effective than N95. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And although it's a bit heavier, but it is safer also for that. Are these are these easily available in India, sir? Pradeep, we can't hear you. Are not okay, sir. Are these easily available? The questions keep on coming. It is not related to to, to uh, what we are discussing. There was one question on ivermectin. Uh, what is the role of ivermectin? Well, it has been shown to have antiviral activity in vivo. Yeah, in vitro. Sorry. Uh, but in vivo, it has not been shown as yet. Uh, there, there are one, I think one study in uh, human, uh, which is on compassionate ground, which is going to start. But at the moment, I would not say that it is uh, recommended for uh, human use. Sir, one yeah. question which is very relevant, how to sterilize laryngoscope? Because particularly video laryngoscope and uh, fiber optic laryngoscope need to... Dr. Bhaskar, would like to comment on that? How to sterilize the laryngoscope? A lot of people are asking. Laryngoscope, I think uh, paracetic acid can be used. Uh, nowadays, orthothalaldehyde is not recommended. So paracetic acid is okay for uh, if you dip it and you uh, do an enzymatic treatment also to remove the protein fibers and then paracetic acid or anything like that. Thank you. Sir, Mehta, sir, to you. Yeah, otherwise, see, if you're not using a sophisticated laryngoscope, which is gives you a vis direct visual visualization, the regular laryngoscope has plastic plates which are disposable. Yeah. And now they are not that expensive. They cost about 150 bucks or something like that. So we might as well use that, that, that disposable plate and throw them away. But suppose video laryngoscope, video laryngoscope, they are. Yeah, that you will have to sterilize. Yeah, that's what, what that's yeah. what the thing is. You want to be very Dr. careful. Dr. Bhaskar, if you dip it in for 30 minutes in Sidex, is that okay? Sidex yeah. OPA. Actually, Cydex OPA was uh, recommended earlier. Now we are going for paracetic acid. Cydex OPA is also good, but uh, okay. there are certain issues regarding that. That's why we are Hello. going away with Cydex OPA. So paracetic okay, acid that is brings me, safe. Hmm. How do you manage a PP breach? Nurse comes to you and says, sorry, sir, my mask came off when I was doing such a day. Any of you can answer. Sir, this is a very difficult question because most of the staff whom we are uh, uh, going to, they are going to tell, we are already on hydroxychloroquine. We can only train and train and train them and reinforce that should not happen. If it happens up to maximum under QTC monitoring, you can keep under observation, keep them under full quarantine, treat them with hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin in combination and hope and pray that they should not get infected. But I think again, for education and education will do the purpose, but it happens, you need to send them in quarantine, complete quarantine. Yeah, first and you need to de roaster her from duty also. Yeah, that's why I'm saying you send yeah. Yeah. you need to send her quarantine and treat and her. How long to quarantine? See, class 14 days. Initially, you should quarantine them for 14 days. 14 days. 14 days. 14 days. 14 days. No, uh, sir, if you no. start putting everybody in quarantine, no, no, no. You should expose to these people. No, Almost no, sir. all the hospital people no. who where Shubal. the people have been there, they have been quarantined for 14 days. Sir, Subal, Subal, yeah. Subal, Subal, uh, to make, uh, keep your human resources ready, I personally feel that uh, it is like that a lot of people are doing in the US and other places what I have learned from them, that you start treatment, uh, uh, if they do not show any sign up to seven days, you can test two tests, if two tests are negative, probably your patient is negative. If two tests 24 hours apart, properly sample taken, particularly the nasopharyngeal, if they are negative, then they are negative. If they are showing any signs and symptoms, I'm talking about particularly if the, there is a breach in PP. I'm not talking about the routine case. If there is a breach in PP and they're suspect, but there's no signs and symptoms uh, for five to seven days and uh, two samples have been negative, probably after seven days you can take on work. Yeah, and sir, one so thing, Meta, sir, one, who, who Meta, all sir, one thing. Work? Yeah. So Sorry? Meta, sir, one thing, and before we would ensure as a, uh, that the uh, doning buddy should check the leak test for the PP before uh, N95, before he or she enters into the IST. That's the most important first thing. See, th these are very, very good things to say. And there's yeah. no problem with that. But yeah, ideally, case... for N95 masks, you have a leak test machine available. 
Yeah, I know. How many yes. of us have that? We don't have it. Them. No, no, we are just we are just we are just using a simple leak test by doing. Yeah, that's the, okay. The yeah. Test. That's no, all. That's okay. It's worth doing yeah. it. Yeah. And how do you train them to do that? I think so we all should have a training thing for everybody. Yeah. Therefore, they say that. I the myself didn't know how to don. Yeah. Till we saw this movie films, and then you you have to. So, show them and then you show live. First, you show them the movies and then you show yeah. them live so, how to don and how to doff. So, therefore, they have okay. suggested you should have a doffing, donning, and a their test the buddy to be yeah, yeah. helping. Yeah, somebody you. should be observing yeah. and helping. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, Pradeep. Yes, Pradeep. Yeah, yeah. Pradeep, Pradeep, there is some problem in noise. I think you need to log off and then log in again. It's completely breaking. We cannot hear you. Can't hear anything. Yeah. Yeah. Doffing, sir, the yes. doffing area, the doffing area should be large enough. We should not contaminate the area where we are doffing. It is good that somebody is observing us in the donning and doffing phase. Otherwise, yeah. it is good to have a mirror at least in the donning area. Yeah. And and now, although it looks theoretical, but people are also saying. If you are too much scared while you are doffing, you, you can have a camera recording doing. So, so you can you have need, a camera recording doing. Yeah, Secondly, you, you should see, also see, have so a below neck. neck. If somebody is not watching, yeah, but it looks impractical for us. But people yeah. are doing that also. Um, yeah. If if it's practically possible and you take a camera recording, yeah. and if you have doubt that you have not done it properly, what is most important thing of doffing is that now in each stage after removing everything, you need to wash your hand after removing shoe cover. Then you remove uh, when you remove your every step, and mask, yeah. every step you wash in hand and touch other thing because the moment you have touched the thing you have infected your hand and next time whatever you are going to touch it's going to infect so yeah. initially it was there that one or two times they were washing hand now See, after there, each doffing to just Rajesh, 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 one thing is that of, even before doffing they have suggested you should give a two percent wash with hypochlorite before on the front and back below the neck yeah. and then you should after five minutes then start doffing. As you come out of the hot area, you should have a flush with this. And if you are in doubt, wear a fresh glove over the old glove. Yeah. Then restart. Right. And we generally, once we doff and come out, we have a shower before we. Yeah, you have to. Yeah. You should have a doff, then shower, and then change it to a new set of new clothes, stuff. and then go. Yeah. So there one very important question coming. I think we should address this. What precaution yeah. uh, when the staff goes to home? Anybody wants to take that? What precaution you would give your staff to take when they go home? Anybody answer? Sorry. Yeah. Should, what ideally it should be like? Ideally, it should be like a home when quarantine. You go home, when you go home, he or she should be under a home quarantine. Ideally, if you see certain hospitals say that they should not go home, the hospital yeah. is making arrangements for them to stay. For for about ten different to lot of virus crack, lot of virus crack. Hospitals are not having those facilities. Those yeah, those people should stay in the house, but separately away from. Uh, they they should not be staying away. Should be staying separately in your house separately. It should be like a house quarantine completely. Most of the most of the hospitals have taken over hotels which are nearby. Yeah, and they are staying, or at house you have a separate room away from the main living rooms. You stay. People in US are now staying in a tent in the garages also. They have gone to right. that extent. And if you have old parents or at risk individuals at home, then avoid going home till you are yeah. doing your duties. Okay, there is a there is a question from the audience about what about if you got pets at home? What does one do with the pets? Yeah. Today in the zoo of New York City. One uh, tiger has been found. Positive. Positive. <laughs> so I believe I believe you have to quarantine your pet also when you suspect yourself. No, no, no. Right now we can no, no. think like that only. No. <laughs> don't take, don't come in contact have, with the pet. <laughs> you have to take your there pet. are special and there are special N95 masks which are available for pets. That's and very important. The most most dangerous thing for pets is their paws get contaminated. So whenever they come out. Come in from outside. We have to clean their paws, or you have a cover for their paws. Yeah. Yeah. Am I audible, Rajesh? Now? Yeah. No. Yeah. 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 You're audible. Yeah. Just I have a quick comment. See, we had a serious argument with my radiology department in my hospital regarding sending COVID patients for CT here yeah. because they had a serious objection, saying that when we get a COVID, I think we have a lot of issues in sanitizing the whole environment. 
So okay. I want to, I had this question for you, Ethin sir, or whoever is doing CTs. Yes. Uh, how did you circumvent this? I'll tell you what we did at the end. Mm. Then uh, after I hear from you. May I? Yeah. May I? Yeah. Yeah. We have to avoid CTs. If there is obvious abnormality in chest X-ray, we don't go for CTs. If we, no, we have abnormality, we have high index yeah. of suspicion. That's why we are doing high it. Index of, no, no. If the diagnosis is clear and pre-test probability is high, we can avoid CT. CT has to be done if your clinical picture is not correlating yes. or your X-ray is not revealing anything. Then you go on for a CT. And yeah. second, in big hospitals, it is a good idea to have a dedicated machine COVID patients yeah. as we go to it. See, it is easy said than done. See, we yeah. did uh, have a CT for the first few patients. Uh, when we were not certain of certain things, or we so we took it in the middle of the night. I mean, when other people were not, but otherwise it's difficult to 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 do CT for every patient. And I have not recommended if you know unless you are not unless it affects the therapy. Yeah, and, the and establishment just, yeah. agreed that the CT yeah. scan has a high sensitivity along uh, with the clinical signs of uh, the diagnosing the disease. But I don't think sir, we should sir, use it for that. Sir, sir, my dictum Ideally, is... Ideally, uh, you should please, avoid it as much as possible. Please, yeah. My dictum is... not going is, to change the treatment plan per se. My dictum I'll, will be... I'll tell you the I'm not, a, I'm, not a, I'm not a COVID hospital. That My hospital total is COVID. It's a different scenario. Otherwise, you should not be contaminating other sterile area. When you are going, you cannot do. The ACT, if CT is not going to change your treatment, you avoid doing yeah, it. Yeah, it should not be done just for diagnosis. Yeah. 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 There is one question from the audience. That sir. how... How do you uh, clean the ventilator between patients? I'll take it, sir. What should we yeah. do? Uh, the we should be using viral filters first at the oh. expiratory ports. Mm -hmm. And the expiratory cassette has to be changed from patient to patient. This is possible yes. till the time we don't have a bulk of patients. But when we have a bulk of patients, it will be very difficult to change it every now and then. Otherwise, it should be changed from patient to patient. It should be cleaned thoroughly and goes to CSSD. And then we put a fresh expiratory Hello. gasset. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Sir, since we are here on to ventilators, I would like to just discuss one thing, which mm -hmm. is currently now overall the discussion all over the country. Certain industrial people now have started coming in with indigenous made ventilators. You must be aware of it. So I personally would like to discuss this point here. So what is your opinion? I've got limitations because these indigenous ventilators cannot be compared with ICU ventilators because there are plenty of limitations into this. As far as the use of circuits is concerned, as far as the delivery of FiO2 is concerned, as far as the application of PEEP is concerned, and certain circuits are only, uh, they are very, means a particular kind of circuit can be used only with that particular ventilator. And you cannot use high PEEP. So technically, the yeah. amount of ARDS, the COVID patients are having ARDS, even See, if they have got a low compliance. It's not going to require high PEEP or high FIP. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask a question? Secondly, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes, sir. So yeah. Every patient is not going to require high PEEP or high FIP. Sir, those also, are not also, at this point of time, buying high-end ventilators at a large number of this may be difficult financially. I think one has to be reasonable. For patients who require more sophisticated ventilation, you deserve these ventilators. Yeah. Otherwise, you can make do for some of these, many of these patients without really very sophisticated ventilators. Where I've just tested a few Indian mates. No, of course, I wanted your opinion not, on that. Let's not waste too much of energy on inventing ventilators. There's some companies yeah. who are trying to invent ventilators at this stage, make new ones. You can't do that. I mean, it's a very short notice. I mean, it's a sophisticated. Equipment which you can't right. invent, you already have the wherewithal to one small, that's a different one thing. small, one yeah. small company. Yeah. Mm -hmm. See, when we require these, are not ventilators in true sense, they are just compressors of bamboo bag. Yeah, so it will be a very, very, very desperate situation. Well, will we forced to use it? We are not going to use in a normal circumstance. See, now New York, US, they are intubating 40,000 patients daily, they are short of ventilators, so we are not far away. The day will come and we have learned from previous epidemics while they were resuscitated with an ambu bag. So, See, yeah. 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 So I was discussing with a friend in New York who is yes. in the ICU there and they, many of the elderly patients uh, which uh, who have comorbidities, they may not, they won't even put on ventilators because they are yeah. short, of, short of ventilators. 
also even if they are on ventilator they are not getting any better in a few days time they just take out the ventilator after talking so to these the are the patients who can be shifted over to such so correct I, th yeah. I would think that you may have some this thing as a uh, step down or while you are waiting that also brings me to a lot of discussion is going on particularly uh, among the non intensivists about ventilating two, three, four patients with the same no, ventilator. That is absolutely wrong, sir. That is wrong. I mean, that's even the American Association of Critical Care and the Thoracic Association have already released their guidelines. Yeah, they have released they should, the regime, not they should not be they should not be using. But there are multiple people because of chances of development of bilai or all these problems, the delivery of peep, tidal volume, everything is going to be different. One question is should we avoid nebulization? Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. And if you have to use it, then we can do Anything which breach the circuit, anything which breach the circuit should not be done. Any procedure. And nebulizer is not going to help. We should just put it like that. The nebulizer is not going to help you anyway. What will help you? Uh, uh, and first thing is our safety is important. So do not indulge in any procedure which jeopardize your safety. Be very careful. So no. Yeah. So close suction catheter, don't disconnect the ventilator. Even if they say, even when you turn the patient, you don't have, don't, don't have to disconnect the, uh, the ventilator. And if you have to when you intubate, you inflate the cuff first. Then you, when you connect the ventilator, after you are sure there is no leak, I mean, there is a cuff is inflated, and only then you connect the ventilator. Sir here, sir, here the concept of blocking the tube, they were clamping, but I will say you put Correct. a filter well, over so there. You, block the tube, you can put a filter. You can put a filter and then intubate. So even patient, some secretion comes out that you don't get, uh, it gets over on you. Yeah. So they're important. See, Mr. Modi has announced 50 lakh of insurance for medical personnel who are treating these COVID-19 patients. But let me assure you, all of you, that this insurance is not for people working in the private medical field. It is only for government medical. You have to take care of yourself. You have to take care of yourself, not for... And your safety is most important. Whatever you do, keep yourself safe. That is the most important thing. Also, yes, sir, I have uh, two comments to make, two questions rather. Yeah. So, as for the guideline, uh, it is suggested that we need to change the ventilator tubings every 48 hourly. So, that would it be feasible in our country? That's one question. The second one is the Singapore data is telling us there is a lot of tube blockages that are happening with HME filters vis a vis uh, heated humidifiers. So would our practice change because there have been a lot of reports coming from Singapore uh, practitioners saying there's a lot of extensive tube blockages uh, that is portending uh, threat for these patients. So well, any of the panelists you can comment yeah. on this. I will yeah, take the recommendation is there about heated humidifiers. But I don't think, see, most of us have gone away from heated humidifiers. How many heated humidifiers you'll have in your ICU? I mean, no, because of, again, the risk of uh, mm -hmm. uh, cross-contamination and chances of VAP. So uh, if you have it, sure, it is... Theoretically, a better thing to have. Mm -hmm. But again, chances of leaks and all that is much higher than this. HME is a much mm -hmm. cleaner, uh, less contaminating procedure. And I generally have not seen really too much of blockages of the tubes. And, uh, mm -hmm. Sir, the first question, Dr. Rangappa. Yeah. The no routine circuit change should be done. Yeah. We should not go on for routine yeah, change. I think it's not cost. Pradeep, 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 that recommendation is for every circuit. They recommend for disposable for everybody. So, yeah. I mean, that we need to be indigenous, what we are seeing with the circuit, we do not need to change. What is the reason behind that? Is yeah. there any rational for yeah. doing that? Is there any rational? Is there any rational for that? Some, that uh, not, they are not given rational, so I was just reasoning it out of why this recommendation came from the... No, I don't think not. Even, for filter, even for filter, 20, 48 hours, if it is working well, it's not swell, it's not getting blocked. You continue with what, up to 48 hours. I don't think any reason to do that. But you have to be careful, it should not get blocked. Yeah. Agree, Rajesh. Good. One, one more point. Mm -hmm. The suction jar, we don't discard it. It is again a very, very dangerous procedure from infection control point of view. So you have to have indigenous covers for suction jar, which are leak proof. Do not just go and discard these secretions into the sink. You have to have a suction jar and then it goes into the yellow bag. Mm -hmm. Be very careful with the suction jar. Sir, sir, few, few, uh, I mean, few of them are asking ventilator setting. Can somebody take on that? What ventilator setting to be initiate to begin with? There's some question on ventilator setting. And then one more important thing we need to address that uh, if we are combining uh, chloroquinoin and azithromycin in combination uh, and a patient has borderline QTC high, uh, 
what should be done? It should be given, not given, if we are given what precaution? See, I had a doctor patient who has who had QTC prolongation. I did what? not give it. I yeah. gave anti anti uh, one. Yeah, Yatin no, sir, we had a patient who was on hydroxychloroquine and azithromycin with diarrhea with hypokalemia. He had a QT prolongation, but we corrected potassium, magnesium, and then we just continued. I think it settled. We were monitoring it though. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think as long as we are monitoring, I think we are okay and not allow it to go to the toxic levels. Yeah. Azithromycin is given for three days only. Am I correct? No. How long do you have to finish with azithromycin? Five, seven days. Five, five days. days. This is what five is recommended. Five, 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 five days and plus azithromycin has got a post-antibiotic okay. effect for seven days. Yeah. Sir, ventilator setting. Somebody okay. should discuss. Somebody should discuss ventilator setting because a lot of people are asking about it. Okay, so, there is one question. Um, about if a patient was suspected uh, COVID is a term uh, PCR negative. Yes, that. It's coming. Can, I was just going to, How do you handle it? Negative. Actually, the uh, yeah. first test, maybe if you only uh, send a nasopharyngeal swab, there is a chance of uh, false negativity, okay, uh, if it is early in the infection. So, uh, to increase the yield, we are recommending both a nasopharyngeal swab as well as a throat swab to be dipped uh, in the same viral transport media and sending for PCR. So the chance of yield is around 90, 93% if you put two, two samples together. So if it comes negative, then you can take it as negative. And another question I was... Okay. Uh, that no, no. Doctor, so, Dr. Bhaskar, one, one negative sample, we should not take negative. Because two negative is, samples, is it? Yeah. Two negative samples. In a suspected case? I don't yeah. know. Oh, that is if the first sample is positive, then every two, 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 no. two four days, you have to uh, keep on repeating samples. Okay, till the uh, two consecutive samples is negative, then you can declare the patient as free from COVID. In, this is in case of no. If they are two negative, two ne consecutive, even two for positive. suspected, even for suspected, or that's not the problem case. Sir, even for suspected, suspected, even two negative, and you think the lung is behaving like COVID, still it can be positive because you know this virus attack your AC receptor, and there is a high likely that even in nasal pharynx and even upper respiratory tract, it can be negative, and still your patient is positive. If you suspect, you can you keep on managing like COVID till you get lower respiratory secretion or till he become asymptomatic. Don't leave. It. There are chances where uh, there are report cases where fourth or fifth sample has come positive when it was taken from lower respiratory tract. Okay. The dictum, sir. Here comes the dictum. If you think it's COVID, you have to treat as COVID. The positivity normally is seventy percent, and the way we are sending samples, the return turnaround time is two days. It goes to other city. We don't know if the cold chain is maintained or not. So if you think it is COVID, it is COVID. Treat as per COVID, and the infection control measures have to be like COVID. More important. See, every patient with respiratory symptoms coming at this point of time is a suspect. Absolutely. Travel history and all has gone out of the window now. You know. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now we had a question also. I think after that we should now conclude because uh, it's uh, uh, getting on. I that think. if a patient, what does one do for uh, for patients who are coming for surgery? So I have just today decided to all the elective surgeries or all surgeries. Uh, Plan not semi-elective, whatever cancer surgeries. I have said do an RT-PCR of all the patients preoperative. With some of the other hospitals also started practicing. So at yeah, least I that gives you some I, degree of safety. Not I think, sir, I think we. I yeah. was discussing with Subal just before this started. It's become a problem in my hospital because some of the surgeons have started doing elective stuff what? and bringing them to our ICU. And that is a potential risk for us. So in fact, I've been telling my admin to not do these elective cases. So this is an administrative issue. So yeah. it's a tussle between yeah. surgical team and us and the thought See, process, you know. So but I, this, is a, Dr. Rangalpa, this is a very, very serious issue. We should not take this issue lightly. Why? They are wasting PPEs, they are wasting resources, ISO will be occupied, and the risk of nosocomial COVID to those in fact, those patients is huge. So this should not be allowed at all. And for emergency procedures and for emergency surgeries, there are guidelines. What we have to wear double masks, double yeah, gloves. Do yeah. So in fact, some people have made a COVID theater. Yeah. The separate theater where the highest COVID patients are. 
operated with all the precautions. But how? But I must tell you, I must tell you again and again. The only thing which will save all of us. Okay, I think you had a good decision. Sir, one, sir, one question is, sir, sir, ICMR, sir, ICMR, sir, just one question, sir, one question. So ICMR, hello, yeah. Yes. Sir, ICMR should include testing of surgical patients if the patient is going to be taken up for surgery in a hospital. Because as per ICMR guidelines, the samples are not accepted by any virology center or even the private labs because the because that you are right. That's an elective yeah, thing. They will not accept. Cannot be. So that has to be included that has to be as per ICMR guidelines, Correct. and it should be escalated. No, you are right. Because, yeah, exactly. so that is very important. Okay. Yes. And, so thank you very much, all of you, and thank audience. you, sir. And I'll keep progressing. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, sir. Thanks, sir. All the best. Thank you, Doctor. There are a lot of questions from the audience. Uh, can we take them now? Uh, yes. Uh, for how long we will take this question, sir? Yes, I think uh, it's already six thirty. Doctor, yes, got disconnected, sir. Uh, Sandeep, uh, you have any comments on this? Uh, how long we take questions? Because uh... yeah, I believe uh, well, there is a lot of excitement and there are a lot of questions from the audience, and uh, uh, we can we we can uh, compile we can those compile. we can compile those questions and then we can uh, personally send back the yeah. panelist responses. Yes. I yes. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We maybe we can take uh, maybe two three questions with the if panelists are okay then we'll wind up uh, sandeep if that's okay i'm okay i'm okay with that what about yes and uh, yes yes i'm here yes i am here and, okay. and rajesh mishra and subal if they are there we'll yeah. take it otherwise we'll yes, close doctor so you can see the questions in the q and a box and chat box uh, one person dr rangappa you can start the discussion you can read the questions um, so there are so many questions here. Uh, so ones which have not been discussed. I want to hear answer from. I don't know what question is, Doctor. Someone has asked me this. So they have asked. They said they want answers, but I am not able to see the question he has for the next me. Next one. The next one. What do you what recommend? Means? What do you recommend on wearing face mask? That I think we have discussed elaborately, isn't it, Ash? We can move to the yes, other yeah. one. I will still, still, still one point. Yeah. In the community, start wearing a normal cloth mask. You will be 70% protected. Routine patient interaction, routine hospital visit, wear a surgical mask. High risk interactions, wear N95 mask. Yeah. Very, very simple. And prophylactic hydroxychloroquine in asymptomatic doctors and staff. What is your opinion? High risk, high risk doctors, doctors who are immunocompromised, hypertensive, or like patients who are involved in air transport, air ambulance, such people should probably take. Yeah. I, I, Routinely, you should not take. Yeah, my subscription to that is anyone who is looking after a COVID patient and uh, who <laughs> wishes to be protected along with adequate PPE, they could yeah. consider. I, is what See, it, but one, more, one more point. Chloroquine is no magic bullet and it will not give you a safeguard. So PPE, PPE and PPE, this should be hammered. Do you want to care for patients in laminar flow, theater, or room, AC? Laminar flow is better. Mm. AC should, is not good. If you can give a good ventilation, good enough. Otherwise, they should have a proper separate AHU. But it is not possible. So if you have an open ventilation, it is better. And WHO is also trying to work on that. Because most of our government hospitals or the facilities which government is taking, they have open windows. So it is a good idea to care for them in open yeah. rooms. It allows. I think this question I can ask Dr. Baskar, uh, who I see. Can we say that virus of Indian strain in is mutated and has less virulence as per patient severity? Dr. Baskar? I think, uh, uh, yes, uh, probably uh, we have uh, coming across a lot of particles that the virus is mutating in different countries. So in India, there is a less virulent uh, virus which has come in that uh, we have seen, but we don't have any proof. Uh, we are working on that. Uh, all are working on that. So uh, another thing is that we have a good racial immunity because we, uh, we are suffering from lots of infectious diseases uh, in our country. 
and we have a, a sort of immunity against those uh, infectious diseases. So we'll be probably in a better equipped to uh, counter COVID-19 also. So racial immunity and all those things are coming in. And also another thing is the summer has already set in the uh, higher temperature will, uh, and the dry uh, environment will probably stop the transmission of uh, virus from one person to another transmission that is from uh, the raw uh, the surfaces, surface transmission. I, I have a opposite view on this, sorry for that. Mm -hmm. See, this virus is constantly mutating. This is the characteristic. Mm -hmm. So if it mutates further, we don't know. We cannot drop our guard. Why we have less mortality? Because we haven't been faced off with the virus. This, this, it has just started trickling. The mortality is not just dependent on the virus or the patient. It depends on our health resource utilization. The system just crashed. Patients die at home in Italy, in Spain. So, uh, if your words come to nothing like it, but we have to, we have to be very, very careful. And I will no, be it's very, very, uh, very early to comment because yeah. this virus is only four months old. No, we are yeah. constantly uh, scientists are studying. I it. wish, <laughs> I wish your words come true, but yeah. There is one question: Are we in stage three? I think the hotspots have been identified. Their community transmission is occurring. Yes. And now there is no chance of uh, the already 14 days have passed after the international flight stopped. Mm. So there is no uh, travel history is gone. Yeah. Now everything yeah. is contact, either contact stage two or stage three. So three. I think we have already entered uh, stage three. And another question to Dr. Baskar, can H1N1 positive patient also be positive for COVID? Yes, uh, there may be there may be uh, coexistence of two viruses that we are getting in biofire panels. Also, we are getting two or three viruses, but oh. biofire uh, so far is uh, doesn't contain COVID. But we have seen that uh, possibility yeah. of co-infection with two different viruses. Can I add? There is a lot of co-infection. There is co-infection with influenza. There is co-infection with RSV. And as you so, if you have influenza positive or H1N1 positive, don't drop your guard again. It could be a yeah. super edit. It could be on TB, it could be on bacterial pneumonia. Yes. I think yes. we'll take two more questions and wind it, uh, Yes. Uh, this, is, this one is interesting. Should we consider therapeutic anticoagulation in patients with COVID-19 related refractory hypoxemic respiratory failure given the fact that they can have microthrombi? It should be personalized. Yeah. I would say prophylaxis fast tag still remains. So thromboprophylaxis yes. definitely they will be on. So our hope yes. and prayer is that would mitigate to some extent some microthrombi. I think we need more studies because there is one study which has come out on heparin infusion which showed favorable benefit, but we need bigger studies to conclusively suggest that yes, it has a role. It should be personalized and should be based on D-dimer or thromboelastograph, whatever we are comfortable with. I think Rajesh Mishra wanted us to answer this ventilatory settings. I think this I covered in the talk. I think it is a yeah. standard ARDS ventilation if it is recruitable lungs. If it is non-recruitable, then be wary of uh, good compliance. Then the, your therapy and your ventilatory settings, they don't need high PEEP. They may not need prone position. This is what Gattinoni paper showed us, that uh, if they have a very compliant lung, then obviously these measures will not help. And if they have a non-recruitable lung, then proning will add modest benefit. And if you give high PEEP for a non-recruitable lung, the detrimental effects will be will outweigh the benefits. I think this is what we have understood because there are two phenotypes of COVID that has been described. One phenotype is with low compliance who would uh, respond to your conventional ARDS net ventilation. The second phenotype is high compliant and a disproportionate shunt fraction who do not re uh, respond well to your arts net ventilation. I think this is what we have understood at this. So you need to identify whether your patient belongs to type one phenotype where they are uh, compliance is low or the type 2 where there is a perfusion abnormality. I think this is what we have understood as yeah. uh, at this point. One more point, whatever mode you are comfortable with. See, we, this is no time to learn a new art and many of non-critical care people will be ventilating these patients. So whatever mode you are comfortable with, they might require a moderate PEEP most of the time. If it is like conventional ARDS, you treat it like conventional ARDS. Otherwise, simple basic ventilation will do. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, so, uh, Sandeep, over to you. You can close the session, Sandeep. Yeah, thanks a lot, Dr. Pradeep. Thanks, Dr. Yash. Thanks, <laughs> Dr. Vaskar. And uh, thanks to all the, all the delegates who have attended this program. It was uh, 
too much exciting and then it crosses the time limit that that simply shows the kind of energy and passion our medical fraternity is having towards the society and towards uh, the this pandemic uh, i'm really thankful and then very soon we will be uh, we'll be getting back with the, with the next topic maybe in coming 10 days thanks yeah. a lot thank you thank you sir thanks dr baskar sir thank you thank you thank you bye bye thank you dr baskar dr kumbhakar thank you